Are we on? Hi. It's great to be here. Um, I, I'm not good at standing still, so I use this mic. If my mother was here today, instead of seeing me, you'd see this woman about <laughs> this tall, with white, fluffy hair and big blue eyes and an accent like Zsa, Zsa Gabor's. Good morning, my darling childrens. I am so happy to be here seeing all your beautiful faces. And my mother started every single talk by saying this one thing. I have come here today because I love you. And she'd mean that with her whole heart. And it truly is my prayer every time I have the chance to, to share her story that that love could be felt. My mother was born in Poland. She was the oldest of five beautiful sisters, she used to say. Her father was an architect. Her mother was a homemaker. And when mom graduated high school, her dream was to become a nurse. And so her parents sent her to nursing school. First time she'd ever been away from home. And so it was exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. She'd only been to school a week, maybe 10 days, when one morning, September 1st, 1939, she walked out of the campus and the sun that had been out was gone because airplanes were flying all over dropping bombs everywhere. Without any warning, Hitler had invaded Poland. 16 days later, Stalin also invaded Poland. And just like that, her whole country was gone. They did what they could to turn her school into a makeshift hospital, but mom said one afternoon there was a group of people who came by. They called themselves the Polish underground, or the partisans, and they were looking for volunteers people who would join up and fight the enemies in the country. Some of the teachers joined up, and mom, who was just 18, she joined up too. They had to go into the forest to live, dig holes in the forest floor, covered themselves with tarps. They had some blankets, ammunition, but it starts getting really cold in Poland, and they didn't have enough warm clothing or supplies, so a small group decided to go to a nearby town to get some more things. Mom was part of this group. They had to walk through the forest floor until they got to the road that would lead to town. And when they got there, the older people in the group said, Irene, you stay back. Mark the trail. We'll go get what we need. So she stood there all by herself. And she said at the edge of town, she could smell a bakery baking up hot, fresh cinnamon rolls. She was so hungry that, that that smell was intoxicating and she was concentrating so hard on that that she didn't hear or see a truck full of Russian soldiers coming her way. But those soldiers saw her. Several of them jumped out of the truck and chased her. She ran as fast as she could, but they caught her, beat her, ripped her clothes off, gang raped her, and left her for dead in the snow. I don't know how long she lay there, but eventually another truck full of soldiers came by. They saw her body lying there, stopped, picked her up, threw her in the back of the truck, and dropped her off at a Soviet hospital. She was there for a long time because her injuries were really severe, but eventually she got better. But unlike hospitals today that you get to go home because of her involvement with the partisans, she was not free to leave. But at one point, she found a way to escape, got out of a two-story window, fit through a little crack in the fence, and ran as fast as she could. She wasn't even sure where she was, but she hoped maybe a town or two away she had an aunt that lived there. And so this time, very carefully, she made her way through the streets. Well, one evening, she came to a part of the town that was just weird, she said. The whole area was evacuated. Doors to houses and buildings were left open, windows broken, no one in sight. It was getting late and she was tired, so she found a building, went upstairs, fell asleep on the second story floor. But in the morning, she woke up to screaming, shouting down in the street. So she went to the window and looked down and she saw a sight no one was meant to see. Our history books refer to it as a death march. But what mom saw 
was a mass of people being herded down the street like they were cattle. These were all Jews. She could tell they had bands on their arms with the Star of David on them. Mom said, looking at this group of people, it would be like if the police came to your neighborhood and broke into every single house and took everyone out. There was a cross section of people from elderly all the way down to newborns, families of all ages and sizes. Mom saw one young mother who was holding a tiny child as she walked, and for no apparent reason, a, a soldier came up, grabbed that baby, threw it in the air, shot it. She watched as they continued to walk down the streets of the town, and she snuck downstairs and followed at a distance. At the edge of town, there was a, a large field, and someone had dug a great big pit in that field. The Jews were forced to stand around the edge of that pit. Mom found a fence and hid behind it and watched. She watched as the parents covered their children's eyes with their hands. And she watched as they were shot. My mom was raised Catholic. And she had a simple, childlike faith. But she said, watching this horrific sight, she said, I raised my eyes to the heavens and I screamed out, my God. How can you let something like this happen? I don't understand. She was so upset that she screamed, I don't even believe you are there. But as she kept walking, she said there was one thought that settled into her heart, into her soul, and it was this, that God gives us free will to be good or bad, to help and heal, or to hurt and harm and it's up to us to decide what we'll do. And she said it was right then and there that she made a promise, a vow, that if there was ever anything she could do to help, she would. Well, she kept walking and she finally found the right town where she knew her aunt lived, the right street, the right house, and just as she was coming up to the house, the front door opened up and out came mom's four sisters. Her whole family had gone there looking for her and she had a wonderful reunion with them. But it was very short-lived because the German soldiers, they came and took her father away. He was an architect. They wanted him to build factories for the German war front. And in war, you do what you're told or you're killed. So my grandfather and grandmother and the three younger of my mom's sisters, they went to be with him, but they didn't take my mom or the next oldest sister because where they were going was next to a facility that was training German soldiers, and they didn't want the two teenage girls being close to that. A couple weeks later, my mom and aunt and sister went to church one Sunday morning, and when they left the building, they found that they were surrounded by soldiers who pushed and shoved and segregated people. If you were really old, you were put aside, and if you were very young, you were put aside but everybody who was capable of work was rounded up and put on trucks. My mom was put on a truck separated from her family, taken away, and forced to work in a munitions factory making ammunition for the German war front. The conditions in the factory were terrible. It was freezing cold. There was barely enough to eat. And one day, a high-ranking German official, a major, he kept kept going by this factory to make sure that production was being kept up. And when he walked by my mom's section, she ended up fainting right at his feet. When she woke up, she was in the office with this man, and she was so afraid that if he thought she couldn't keep up, he could send her further away or just have her killed. And so she pleaded with him, please, sir, I, I haven't been well, but I'm strong, and I'm capable. If you just give me one more chance. This major, who was about 60 years old, looked at this teenage, blonde, blue-eyed girl whose last name was Gut, sounds German. My mom could speak German. And he asked her, are you a German girl? She answered truthfully, no, I'm Polish. He said, I like that you're honest, but it's apparent you can't keep up. You'll come with me. I'll give you another job. He took her to the camp that he was in charge of. It wasn't a concentration camp. 
It was a camp that housed German officers, secretaries, soldiers, and mom's job was serving meals in the diner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And she was given one other job, and that was to oversee the laundry room. And it was when she went in the laundry room that she was introduced to the 12 Jewish people who were forced to work there. One was a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, an accountant, a nurse, married couples. These were all people of means, people with beautiful homes filled with precious things that we all have, and everything they had had been taken from them, given to someone else, and now they lived in the ghetto next door, took care of their captives' clothes. They were starving, but mom could easily sneak food from the diner enough to feed them, in fact, enough food for them to distribute amongst the ghetto. But more important than food, she realized that when she was serving meals in the diner and the Gestapo were there or the SS, she could overhear plans, plans where they would decide to, to raid new areas of town and she could get that information to her friends, and hundreds of people were able to leave areas before they got raided. But one night, the major had at his table one of the heads of the Nazi party, and when mom went up to, to serve him, she heard the Nazi tell the major, next week, don't plan on having any of your Jews here. You'll have to find substitutes. The major argued, what are you talking about? I've got quotas to fill. How am I going to get my work done without my workers? And the Nazis said, you hire Poles, hire gypsies. I have my orders that by this time next week there won't be one Jew left alive. And mom realized that, that meant her 12 friends. And she had the terrible decision on whether she should tell them that in one week even the little bit they had would be gone. But when she did tell them, they pleaded with her, Irene, help us, do something. She said, I've got a little room above the diner with, with a single bed and a, a wash basin. I've got no place to hide 12 people. But that night she got down on her knees and she prayed for a miracle. And in the morning she had one because the major came to her and he said, I'm taking a villa at the end of town. I'm gonna be doing a lot of entertaining you're gonna come and be my housekeeper. She went that day to the villa to look at it, and when she walked up to the front door, she noticed a mezuzah there on the doorpost. Mom had enough Jewish friends growing up to tell her exactly what that meant. A wealthy Jewish family had lived there, and there was rumors going around that Jewish people in that area oftentimes had a hiding place somewhere in that house, and she prayed that was true. So she asked the major for a pass so she could go from the camp to the villa over the next couple of days to get things ready. And over the next couple of days, she helped all 12 of her friends escape out of the laundry room, out of the camp, down the streets of the town, to the villa, down a coal chute, and into the basement until all 12 of them were there in the basement of the German major's house. And she breathed a sigh of relief until the major came and walked through the place. Irene, this house is filthy. I want it scrubbed, I want it painted from top to bottom. And he made her arrive the next day with a squad of German soldiers ready to do that. She kept her friends quiet in the basement and started the soldiers upstairs. When they were finished, she brought the soldiers from the front staircase down, took her friends from the back staircase, hid them in a tiny spot up in the attic for days until the rest of the house was cleaned and painted. Finally, those soldiers left. She was able to bring her friends back down to the basement and breathe a sigh of relief until the major walked through again. Irene, the house looks much better. We're gonna start entertaining soon. There'll be big parties, a lot of work, but not to worry. I'm gonna bring a soldier who can help you with everything. He can sleep in the basement. It wouldn't work, so she went to the major and she pleaded with him, please don't bring a soldier to be with me all day long. I'd be a nervous wreck having him here. She had to tell him what had happened to her with the Soviet soldiers. He said, don't be an idiot. Nothing's going to happen to you in my house. You're perfectly safe here. But she pleaded, she begged. She said, I can take care of everything myself. You'll see. 
He said, we're going to have parties for 30, 40, 50 people a night. Besides shopping and cooking, there's heavy lifting, repair work, gardening, laundry, ironing. One person can't do all that. She continued to plead and beg until he said, enough. I'll give you one chance. The first time you embarrass me, the first time you can't keep up, my soldier comes in. So they had this great arrangement because every morning the major would get up, have breakfast, and he'd leave the villa. Mom would follow behind with her house key. And as soon as he left, she'd put her key on the inside of the door. That way, if he came home before he was supposed to, his key couldn't unlock the door. He'd have to ring a doorbell. Mom had one of the men downstairs rig up an alarm bell that she could hit if there was ever any problems or if somebody came to the house, they could hear it in the basement and know to be quiet. And every day, they searched through that villa, hoping to find the hiding place. Sure enough, they did. It was down in the basement. You had to lay on your stomach on the ground. But there was one small panel of wood on the wall that could be removed. And when it was, you saw a tunnel that wrapped around the whole side of the villa and ended in a small room that sat just underneath the gazebo in the side yard. So every day the major would get up, have breakfast, grab his hat, his coat, his briefcase, head out the door, mom would follow with her key, put it in the lock, and then race to the basement door, open it up, all 12 of her friends would come up. The men did the heavy lifting, the repair work, the women did the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, the ironing. <laughs> and every day the major came home amazed <laughs> at what a teenager could accomplish. The nights, she said, were filled with parties where the Gestapo dined on the food that the Jews had made earlier that day. The Jews had had to be so quiet during these times, they couldn't cough or sneeze for fear of being found out. That's how they lived for almost two years until two of the 12 in the basement, a married couple, Ida and Laser Holler, they'd been married for years and had never been able to have children and now they found out that they were expecting a baby. These parents desperately wanted the child, but they felt like they had no choice. And my mom was given a list of supplies to terminate the pregnancy. She pleaded with them, Ida, Laser, please. I, I don't know how, I don't know why, but I believe it's a sign that everything will work out, that we'll be okay. I've already seen so many innocent people murdered. Hitler is not going to have this baby. It took a lot of convincing, but finally they all agreed, we'll either all live together or we'll all die together. And life went on until one day mom had to go to town to get some more food and supplies for another upcoming party. And when she was in the store, she said two German soldiers came in and yelled at everyone, get outside. She had no idea what was going on, but when she walked out, she realized the whole town had been evacuated. Everybody was now on the sidewalks on either side of the street. In the middle of the street was a set of gallows that had been erected. There was a Polish Catholic family with two small children, and they had been caught hiding a Jewish family with a small child in their house. There were signs on every street corner in Poland saying death would happen if you were caught helping a Jew. And that day in town, everyone was forced to stand and watch what that looked like. Mom said that they hung the children first and made the parents watch. And she said, I close my eyes. But even with closed eyes, you can see because you can hear and you can feel what's going on. And it was that day walking back to the villa, she said, I, I was like a zombie. All she could think of is, I can't tell my friends what I've seen. There's nothing they could do about it. But because she was so shook up, she forgot to do what she had done every day for the last two and a half years. She forgot to leave her key in the door. She went to the kitchen and she put her groceries down, opened up the basement door, let three of the women come up to help her with the evening meal. She said, we were standing there cooking and talking and all of a sudden there was a noise at the kitchen door and they turned and there was the major, eyes bulging, chin shaking. He turned right around and he went to his office where the telephone was. 
Mom told her friends to get downstairs and she said, I ran after him and I grabbed a hold of his legs to stop him. He turned around and screamed at her, how could you do this in my own home, under my own nose after all I've done for you? Why? She was crying, said they're my friends. No one has the right to kill because of race or religion. These people, they've done nothing wrong. Punish me, kill me, but let them go, they're innocent. He screamed at her again. Turn you in? You think I can march you down to the Gestapo and they're not gonna believe I didn't know I had Jews hiding in my own house? You've killed us all. I have to have time to think. I'm gonna go to my office and when I do, don't you go anywhere, don't you talk to anyone. As soon as he left, she ran into the kitchen. She got food and water, went down to the basement, gave it to her friends and said, get in the hiding place. If I don't come back in three days, it means I'm dead. You'll have to get yourself out. And she went back upstairs to wait. Finally, he came back, went into his office, sat down at his desk. She had no choice but to go and face him. And when she did, he reached out, grabbed her by the waist, pulled her down on his lap. I've made a decision. I'm going to keep your secret before a price. You have to be mine anytime I ask, and willingly. Mom said there was no decision to be made. There was too many lives at stake. And she never told her friends in the basement what had to happen. She said their integrity would have never let her make that decision. But they did all survive. And eventually the Soviets started pushing the Germans out of Poland and the whole war front began to collapse. And at one point, the major came to mom and said, I have orders to move my unit. Are you coming with me? She said, I want to find my family. It had been years. She didn't know if her parents and sisters were alive even. And so as he started getting, making preparations to move out, mom contacted her friends, the partisans who were still out there in the forest, and said, make room. I'm bringing you 12 people and one very pregnant woman. She took the major's wagon and her friends by two, laid them in the bottom of the wagon, covered them with blankets and shovels and food, and rode from the villa out to the forest to where the partisans were, back and forth, back and forth, until they were all 12 there. And she stayed that last time. And six days later, a little baby boy was born out there in those woods in freedom. Ida and Laser named their son Roman, Roman Holler. And mom said holding baby Roman was her payment in full for everything she'd gone through. Now they all wanted her to continue to stay out there in the woods, but she wanted to find her family and she left. A lot of things happened during this time, but at one point mom was captured, this time by the Russians. After all, she'd been the mistress of a high-ranking German official and the Russians accused her of being a spy. And now mom was put in a concentration camp told that she'd be sent to Siberia for the rest of her life. She would just disappear off the face of the earth. The Soviets, they hired men to deliver food to the prisoners, and a lot of times they hired Jewish men. After mom had been sitting in this camp two or three months, one of the Jewish men they hired happened to be one of the men she'd hid in the basement of the major's house. And when he came that night, he happened to see her and he called out, Irene, what are you doing here? She was so overwhelmed at seeing a friendly face that she said, I just stood there and cried. He left, but he came back with friends that night and they smuggled her out of that camp. They dyed her blonde hair black, gave her false identity papers. She wasn't going to be Irina Gut, Polish Catholic. Now she was Sonia Sofristin, a Jewish refugee. <laughs> They smuggled her out of Poland into Germany and she was left at a displaced persons camp where she sat for two years trying to put her life together. She found out her father had been shot and killed for refusing to move off the sidewalk when he was told. Her mother had a stroke and didn't survive. She couldn't find out anything about her four younger sisters and assume that they had died. As the war was ending, there was a group of men from the United Nations who came to do interviews of the survivors, and an American delegate came to the camp Mom was at. 
He could speak English and French. And he interviewed mom who could speak Polish, German, Russian, and quite a bit of Yiddish. <laughs> and through an interpreter, she told her story to him. And he was the one who said the United States of America would be honored to have you. She wanted to try and stay in Poland, try to find her sisters, but she was wanted now by the Germans and the Russians. And she was afraid if any of her sisters survived, she could bring great trouble to them. So in 1949, she came on a cargo ship into the United States. I loved that part of the story when she would tell it, standing on the bow of that boat as she came into New York Harbor, seeing the Statue of Liberty. She said, I'm in a free country. I have a fresh start, a new beginning. And she said, I put a do not disturb sign over my memories. I will never talk about what I've gone through. My life starts fresh here. She entered the United States with no money, no English, and not knowing a soul, but she could speak Yiddish and she was in New York. <laughs> she made some great friends who helped her find a job in the garment district, a little, little apartment. It took mom five years, but she became a United States citizen and she'd been saving up for this occasion. She was gonna take herself to lunch in Manhattan. So she found the restaurant, really crowded that day. But as she was eating, a gentleman came up and said, may I sit here? And then he looked at her, I know you. He was the UN delegate who'd interviewed her in the displaced persons camp in Germany, the very man that invited her to the United States. Well, he asked that pretty young blonde to dinner that night, and the next night, and six weeks later, they were married. <laughs> <laughs> My parents moved from the East Coast out to the West Coast, where I was born, and mom, she became an interior decorator. <laughs> she was really good, too. <laughs> and you know, until I was 14 years old, that's all I knew about my mom. She was beautiful and talented and very elegant. Never heard any of these stories I just told you. It wasn't until one evening we were having dinner and the phone rang, mom got up to answer it, and on the other end of the line, was a college student who was doing a survey for a report in school. And this topic, the Holocaust never happened. It's just propaganda drummed up by the Jews so we'd feel sorry for them. And he was calling random people to find out what they thought. Hmm. He found out. <laughs> <laughs> and I did too that night. You know what I remember was after she hung up the phone, Again, tears streaming down her face from bringing the memories back and her looking at us and saying, all these years that I've kept silent about what hate does, I've allowed evil, I've allowed the enemy to win. And she said, from now on, I am willing to go anywhere to talk to anyone so that these things never happen again. That's exactly what she did. It didn't take very long until mom was traipsing all over the country sharing her story. You know, what I've learned is my mom's daughter, first of all, is the topic of this story. It's kind of a strange topic at first when you hear it, but it's love. Weird name for a Holocaust story. It's not when you think about it because for these things to never happen again, love is exactly what's required. When we can look at someone else who's different, speaks different, looks different, comes from a different place, speaks a different language, votes differently, and say, I may not understand you, I may not agree with you, but you're part of my one human family, and we are all connected, and I'll stand with you, and I'll love you. That's what stops things like genocide and holocaust from happening. And you know what I've learned again from being my mom's daughter? That when you're willing to love like that, I'm not talking Valentine kind of love, love with skin on, love that costs and hurts sometimes. Your, love goes, your life goes from this size to endless. It's true, I've seen it myself. In 1982, my mom received a phone call from a young man named Roman Holler. You remember who he was? that baby. <laughs> he wasn't a baby anymore, he's a grown man, and his son was about ready to be bar mitzvahed. And he looked all over the world for my mom, whom he called his mom, so that she could go to, to Israel and be a part of that ceremony. 
That was a highlight of her life. But when she met up with Roman, she found out something incredible. And that's what happened to the major that she'd lived with as his housekeeper. When the war was over, Major Edward Rugemer, that was his name, he ended up going back to his wife in Germany. Only his wife heard he'd had a long affair with his young Polish housekeeper. <laughs> she wanted nothing to do with him. She refused to let him back into the house. And so he went to his friend, men he'd known his whole life in town. But there was rumors going around about the major. People were saying he was a Jew sympathizer. There was big fear associated with that in Germany right after the war, and nobody let this man, now very close to 70, in their home. He had nowhere to go, and he was literally forced to live on the streets, a homeless man. When Roman's parents, Edith and Laser Holler, heard about what happened to the major, they were still living in Germany, in Munich at the time. They put Roman in the back seat of their car. They drove to that town. They searched the streets. They looked at every homeless face until they found him. And then they put him in the back seat. And Roman grew up calling him Zeda until the day he died. He lived with the Hollers for the rest of his life. Can I add one more powerful word to love? Forgiveness. If you want to have power stronger than any army, any weapon, put those two together, love and forgiveness. They're the only things that soften the hardest of hearts and open the most closed minds. In 1984, my mom was speaking to a large group of people in LA and afterwards, a couple right in the front row came up and said, Irene, we're going to Poland. We'd love to try and help you find your family. She said, my sisters are all gone. I looked for them. It's been 40 years. Poland was still a communist country, so it was hard. She gave what she knew, Janina, Maria, Bronia, Wajagut. This couple went to Poland, and they were diligent when they were there. She checked with the consulates, with the Catholic churches, nothing. On the last day in a taxi cab, on the way to the airport to fly home, they asked the driver if he would pull over at a little store so they could buy some snacks. He found a store, they got out, they got their items, went up to the shopkeeper and thought, let's try one more time. And they pulled that list of names out. Do you know these women? Janina, Maria, Bronia, Wajagut? He said, I'd never heard of them. But there had been a woman shopping in the back of the store. She heard it. She came running up, grabbed the list out of their names, pointed at one of them, pointed at one of the names and said, this one is me. These others are my sisters. And so this couple was able to give my Aunt Bronia my mom's address. And 10 days later, mom got, well, she called it a letter from heaven, a letter from all four of her sisters. So after 40 years, we were able to get my mom a plane ticket back to Poland. You know, sharing her story for me over the last 16 years has been incredible journey, starting off dragging my feet, and now it's a passion. But I want to tell you, sharing my story to the, the Jewish Federation of North America is a downright honor. Let me tell you why. I told you that once my mom started speaking, she stopped being an interior decorator. Speaking was the highlight of her life, but it doesn't pay like being an interior decorator. <laughs> And that was okay, because she, it was an important thing for her to do. But one day, my mom came back from traveling, and when she pulled into the driveway, her neighbor stopped her and said, Irene, we found your husband several days ago. He was wandering several blocks away. He couldn't remember how to get home. We knew my dad's memory was failing, but Alzheimer's hit him so quickly, there was not even close to enough money to put my dad in a home. There wasn't even enough money for my mom to hire somebody to sit with him when she went and traveled. And I was already living up in Washington State by then. And so some time later, my mom was contacted by the Jewish Federation here on the East Coast to come and speak. And she explained to them why she couldn't and thought that was it. 
Well, the Jewish Federation on the East Coast contacted the Jewish Federation on the West Coast and probably several in between. And a few days later, my mom received a phone call from the Jewish Home for the Aged in Reseda, California. It was a gorgeous facility specializing in senior care and specializing in Alzheimer's care. There was only three really huge problems. You had to be Jewish to go there. It was very expensive, and there was a long waiting list. But that day, the president of the Jewish Home for the Age said, Irene, you have to understand that the Jewish Federation of North America has left us no alternative but to break every rule <laughs> we have. Hmm. Bring your husband in this afternoon. And I want you to know that we will love him like he's our family that we will treat him as if he was one of us. The Federation completely took care of my father's bill, and they continued to support my mom. My mother was made an honorary line of Judah. <laughs> So this is her pin, I inherited it. And I wanna tell you, as a Christian, I wear this pin, and this necklace a lot, because it means everything to me. And I want people to come up and ask me, what is that unusual piece of jewelry that you have? So I can tell them about an organization that I've been to probably more than any other person in this world I'm the most Jewish Christian you'll ever meet. <laughs> but I've seen firsthand what you do with your funds, how you take care of people in your community, in Israel, and far beyond. I hope that you're as proud of being a part of this federation as I am. I hope that you understand what an awesome thing you're a part of. And I hope that at whatever level you are, you dig in and grow deeper. Thank you so much for this honor. God bless you.